Hello and thank you for joining me here today. I'm with Elliot Akili and you're watching the Leighton Pearson Show. You are watching the Leighton Pearson Show. Uh, say hi, Hel Elliot. Oh, kia ora, kia ora Leighton, kia ora people. So today we're here to talk about the, the uh, Refugee Migrants Pact from the UN. And... Uh, if you'd give a little background, Ali, uh, could you do that? Sure, sure. So there has been for the last few years a discussion within the UN about uh, a way to make migration orderly and safe and however which way they use their words. They all engaged in the discussion, but there were issues that certain countries were having. For example, Australia and the US, especially since they disproportionately have to deal with illegal immigration or illegal migration attempts, they have always had some issues with it. So when it came down to it, uh, they did the final draft and that was signed off in one area last year and then at Marrakesh, they, the UN gathered together except for those who were, uh, except for those who were already saying, no, we're not going to sign this due to issues of sovereignty mostly. Uh, and they all agreed New Zealand was one of them. Uh, and then it was very interesting because while most had actually signed it, our government did not admit that they had signed it until the last hour of the last day of Parliament sitting in 2018, last year. Yeah, yep, yep. So now it's, yeah, now it's pretty much it's all good to go. I mean, into the idea is, a lot of their push is that it's non-binding and that it's got sovereignty guarantee in within the document and those elements. Right, right, right. Um, and and what would your main, if we were to uh, make a summary, uh, summary of, of your uh, problems with the document, what would it be? Number one by far would be sovereignty. The document states the places that it's going to allow or that they won't cross sovereignty. But by its very by its very writing, every objective starts with we commit to. Not only that, the wording within it is, is a very big mishmash of the UN agreed directions and it is signed off by each country to follow those directions. Uh, and it, it just fascinates me that, that we even had our... Well, actually, no, it does make sense because Winston Peters and Justin Ardern, of course, put through, put it to their lawyers or the law commission, whatever it was, and, and that commission came back and said it's non-binding. Mm -hmm. I actually believe that you're looking at a bit of a, a loophole there because, yes, it's probably not binding, as in the UN cannot make a direction and New Zealand will follow, but instead it's a promise that the current New Zealand government will make it binding themselves. Therefore, they can skip around the old UN's as making it binding. Another interesting point, though, is that even when, as far as we're concerned, it was an absolute uh, uh, incremental or a, a, probably a big step within an incremental push to replace New Zealand sovereignty with a foreign ideological sovereignty, the other element of it was very recently we've also had other countries, specifically within the EU, who are now stating that the, the pact should be binding, even on those, and, and I'm going to try to get the English translation quote as close as I can, even to make it binding even for those countries who pulled out of the agreement. And that's actually only been in the last week. How is that, the, how is that even yeah. possible? Well, there was the occasion because of the UN being a democratic system and they have their own various laws and arguments. Even Angela Merkel did state that if there was a certain percentage, if a certain percentage of the countries did sign up to it, then the rest would have to go along with it as per that. Mm, I'm not sure if you'd call it a quorum or if you'd call it a majority vote or, or anything like that. But... Uh, um, that's what's going on right now. So we're just still watching what's happening. Now, now, it should be mentioned that I think the context of that speaking was within the EU. 
because of course there are a couple of there are a few countries in there who are just adamant we are not going to put up with open borders we're not putting up with the migration pact because it's it also does it changes the sovereignty aspects as well as uh, being very blurry to the point of being non-existent when we're talking about irregular versus illegal versus legal versus regular that whole gray area so there's um yeah, right now it's very fascinating to watch what's going on over in the EU. Right. I know that you're probably going to be very careful how you say it, because I want to move on in a minute, but do you think that New Zealand should pull out of the UN? Oh, what was that, sorry? Should New Zealand pull out of the UN? Yes, absolutely. We should pull out of the uh, Oh, right, the UN. <laughs> let, me, let me correct that. I think we should definitely pull out of signing of the Migration Pact. And we should also, since we're there, we should also be pulling out of the Paris Accord and the Kyoto Pact as well. Those are uh, painfully useless. Uh, in terms of the UN, the question of the UN, I think it's good to have a discussion. But I will, I will, I would not say we should pull out altogether. The reason is reasonably simple. That the, well, there's two main reasons for myself. One, they're still the biggest democratic system in the world. Now, incredibly flawed, and we should have more backbone than what we do, but there are still, it is still an organization that we need to be a part of, if anything, to bring more sanity to what is starting to occur there. And it also has been mentioned that alongside that, the U.S. are still in there, and Israel, who have, who just keep on getting hammered by U.N. resolutions, are still there as well. So we are not in bad company if we stay in there. And if anything, if we leave, if those who, those of us who absolutely promote sovereignty, who promote democracy, and believe in independence and our own destiny, if we all pull out, then who stays in? And consider the, the very powerful resources that those other areas might uh, put in. And, and I don't want to go to it, but, I mean, having a powerful world structure, you know, would make, would change the very outcome, perhaps, of a, of a second six-day war, I suppose, if I'm going to take it to an extreme, or not an extreme, but a improbable situation, an improbable but worrying uh, possibility. Right. So there are, there are definitely reasons as to why we should still be in the UN. Uh, so I would not pull out just yet, but I think we should definitely have discussion as to how much we put in and to, and especially the backbone issue, because I think mostly New Zealand has a very big backbone issue when it comes to the UN. We're small, but why do, why do we have to have no backbone? Right, right. One more question on that is, do you think there's any point that we pull out of the UN? No, not at the moment. If, if, for example, however, if the U.S. came out and, and called for friends and then other elements uh, or uh, perhaps a more traditional old-school area like the Commonwealth or something like that, then sure, let's have that discussion. Mm -hmm. But as it stands, I do not think we should pull out. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I don't think we should pull out. Not yet. All right. <laughs> I know that it's probably um, dangerous uh, politically to to stay um, to, to walk that line. I think. Oh, oh, we live as new conservatives. Man, we live we live in that dangerous area constantly. But, uh, but but I will be straight up though. I don't think we should just yet. Um, and and I always I do. I look towards those who I consider friends, like Israel and the US. Right. They haven't left, and they've got more reason to leave than we do. And they're more they are more self-sustaining, well, sorry, Israel would be a lot, you know, a lot of concern. But, but if I'm being straight up, I, I think that we should not yet, not yet. Right, right, good, that's, that's good. Um, I want to talk about the Objective 17, uh, if, you, if you want to go to that. Objective 17. Because I think that's one of the most important ones with Objective 22 as well. Um, because they kind of just sneak it in there. They, they have all these... Like... Oh, yes. Yes, 17. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. They have all these um, 
they sneak it in there because they have all these like administration objectives, and then yeah. boom, it's like I want to. I, I don't want to read it through all this boring stuff, but I'll read through this. Um, so, I think the biggest thing in here, like, uh, is the fact that they seem to want to. They say they don't want to, but they seem to want to take away the freedom, at least of the press, to be critical of the migration pact. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I find it quite fascinating. So you're talking about uh, Part C, aren't you? Uh, yes. Mm, yeah, and I really do. I, fi I find it fascinating. And, and the reason being is the last line of that, or the last part of the sentence, is, is in full respect for the freedom of the media. <laughs> I, just, I just find <laughs> it hilarious because it, the entire paragraph, basically, it, it effectively is, you know, and I'll, I'll quote elements of it, sensitising and educating media professionals on migrated on migration related issues and terminology. Uh, then you've got along the stopping allocation of public funding or material support to media outlets that systematically promote intolerant xenophobia, racism and other forms of discrimination. Um, and it, it's also quite fascinating because say that you are a paper who's pushing the edge and let's say let's say the militant, which is a very quiet little uh, subscription of communist, uh, it's a communist paper in New Zealand. And yep. I've, I've actually subscribed to it a couple of times because I find it quite fascinating. Um, there are some stuff in there which would actually also, so while they would have their public funding cut, not only that, from part A, which would be enact, implement or maintain legislation that penalises hate crimes and aggravated hate crimes targeting migrants, uh, yada, 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 effectively saying that you can't say anything bad against migration or perhaps even critique, um, then actually the militant would not only not be pen would not only be penalised by the government, but they would also breach the other law so they would effectively be shut down or fined until they shut down. So it's this wonderful crossing of hands because uh, Part C says, you know, the, the government's going to make sure that you don't get any sort of assistance whatsoever in any way, and the other part is you're going to get punished constantly until you until you correct your thinking. And, and that's, of course, is incredibly dangerous and very scary. And, and I will actually also add that this is also going in line with what we've already seen, because in the Human Rights Council, Andrew Little uh, was quoted, and he said that they were looking at the Human Rights Act and, and I'm going to get this as close as I can to a quote as well, with the specific intention of changing legislation around it so that it would prevent their discrimination of any type of gender discrimination, or gender, sorry, discrimination based off gender identity. So you, you've got Andrew Little saying that he's going to change the laws that surround free speech. You've got the signing of this document that is also about changing the ideas and the laws around free speech. And not only that, just yesterday, I think it was, he has again stated that, the, that he wants to push in a hate speech aspect around our, our laws in that. So you've, got, you've already got three direct examples where Andrew Little is wanting to, or this government anyway, is, is going to change what we can say. Mm -hmm. uh, and very worried. Is that the um, what came out today, and that was about the him fast tracking the yes. the hate speech. Yes, that's the, yep, that's the one. Oh yeah, I'll just get that article because I think that's important, and I'll link everything down below for anyone who's who's listening, uh, mm. because I think that's important um, to go over. Hey Philip, how was church today? It was good, brother. I'm glad. What did you learn? We learned how to apply the Bible to our life. Oh, that seems very convenient. Have you ever heard of war walks? No, I don't like war. No, not war as in war, but war as in we are revival. It's a Christian logical based Bible thinking YouTube channel. Ooh, I may have to check that out. Thanks for the recommendation. Well, that's my cold brain failure. Due to the absolute magical case for good. The channel is launching this winter in New Zealand. Other side effects might be, but are not limited to becoming a vegetable, conversion, and good grades. The last one might be a little bit made up. Bye! Okay, so it says that he is fast-tracking a law review which could see hate crimes made new legal offence. Uh, he said the current law on hate speech was not thorough and strong enough 
and needed to change. Mm, yeah, and it's fascinating too because you know they've been milking, they've been milking this disastrous, cowardly attack that happened in Christchurch, and in the most people think, oh, great, good on Andrew Little, blah blah blah, not realizing that actually he signed or his party was government signed the document document last year to do this, and he himself was quoted as stating to the UN Council that he was going to do this. Right. So this gives him the perfect opportunity to push it even faster. Right. And I think I think this whole di- the discussion around hate speech and everything, I think we actually need to talk about um, not just the Constitution as what it is, but I think we need to actually have a document of Constitution, a Bill of Rights and that kind of stuff. I mean, because I want to... Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I agree... I agree. I just worry about. Uh, I think the reason why the American Constitution was so awesome was because it happened after a great deal of pain and blood, and and just you know they managed to free themselves from a a conquering force, or the, you know what was the conquering force before. So when you look at it, when you look at the Bill of Rights, they fought over it, they hung over it, they were went home at night. Um, my concern is that if we did build that right now, we would have something that that would be quite scary. I think. Um, this. I don't. I don't the, the uncodified constitution that we have currently, I do not think would be used as a base. No, no. Well, and I think what I'm going to say is probably really controversial to most people listening, especially if they're from New Zealand. I wouldn't exactly hate us just to copy and paste the American Constitution into law. I... Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be controversial. Uh, I, I, see, I, yeah, I do. I, I love the. Um, yeah, I do have to say, I do love the constitution. Uh, I do. I do like it. For them, it definitely works. I, I, I think you know what? I, I never really thought or imagined how it would be applied in in a New Zealand context. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I can't really say one way or the other. But, but I do. I really like, or at least I love the. The fullness of it, the, the um, yeah, I do. I think it's such a great constitution. I think it's a great piece of uh, uh, work, actually. Mm. I mean, not yeah, just not as law. It's just an amazing read, and it's like you go back into the history of what happened and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think there's concern, especially from my part, uh, in in being a political major. I have a book from Janine Hayward called New Zealand Government and Politics, uh, and when talking about our constitution, uh, she says, uh, quote, New Zealand's constitutional arrangements means that parliament is much more powerful than legislatures in other democracies. In New Zealand, not even courts can tell parliament what to do. And I don't know, but I find that really, really concerning. And it's not like yeah. she, it's not like she's a far right. Everyone goes, she's far right. No, because she, she actually, she thinks that it's, um, oh, what's it called? what does she call it? Unsung hero of our political story. So she is a leftist, and she, so it's not like she's trying to... Yeah. Well, she's, she's correct, though. Yeah. She's correct. And, and going back to your example about the US, I mean, that, that the three branches, you know, you, you, SCOTUS, you've got, you got the executive branch, you've got SCOTUS, you, um, they, they've got their own checks and balances which actually do work, and that's a really good point, actually, because the government, our government, they really can be, I, I suppose... I don't like this term, the, the benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> but I, I guess there is there is an accuracy in there, and I, I suppose you could even back it up with evidence that when there has been when they have been just utterly forced to put in place um, something around their own governance structure, they always dilute things. Mm-hmm. I guess uh, it be probably a good example, I suppose. The, the original MMP was supposed to have a whole raft of different elements to it. But when it came into it, the government at the time, they diluted it quite a lot. Uh, and so they, they, and you could argue reasonably well that they, that they did uh, amend the recommendations to a way that still supported, the, obviously, the two main parties uh, and uh, their, own, their own style of governance. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, I'm probably, I would consider myself probably, well, I would be 
considered extreme politically um, when talking about the MMP because I don't personally believe the MMP because that's a party system. Mm. And I don't think part we should have parties. I think we should vote in MPs and then we should vote in a prime minister or if you call it a president, I don't really care what you call it. Mm. But, but we should vote in them separately and all the MPs um, uh, are there to actually work out law rather than be partisan, you know? Mm, yeah, 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 that's fair, that's fair. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd probably be considered extreme. Um, back to the document itself. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we went on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I find it completely, um, completely against, I guess, what would be considered, quote-unquote, New Zealand values. Um, mm, yes. About free speech. Because it's always been, we, like, we saw this last year, last year, with um, Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern, um, and and how they weren't allowed to speak. And um, it was speculated when they did get in a private place that the reason he cancelled was because he was threatened by the government. I don't know if that's true. I'm not spouting that as fact. I'm just saying that was the rumour. Um, uh. Yeah, I mean, well, well, I mean, what was definitely sure was that the publicly funded venues were cut off. That was, I mean, that part was definitely sure, and that that's offensive enough. Yes, I mean, yeah, because I read the law, like the free the freedom of expression, and it did uh, and saying there that no government like person can enact any kind of action that would would take away the freedom of expression from anyone, and I thought that. That um, that Phil Goff was the sole contributor to the fact that they couldn't speak publicly at the public venues. Uh, yes, and that's why that's why magically he um, that's why that magical genie came along and suddenly it wasn't Phil Goff; it was actually uh, Auckland Live, and that it, it was to do with something else. Even though he had spouted that it was him for for the last oh, whole yeah. two days. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and. and I have, I think I have concerns about New Zealand that it's it's turning into something that is becoming really ugly, uh, something I don't want to see in New Zealand, and something that I'm going to get out of here um, before it turns to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because I, I, I put onto your post about it that it's actually taking the pattern um, of, and I never ever do this. So when I do it, it's serious. Um, taking the pattern of Nazi Germany, because in Nazi Germany, they took away the gun right, the rights to guns. Then Hitler came in, he took away the right to speech, and then he even enforced gun laws even more. Um, and and I predicted. Well, uh, other Jews he did. Yeah, yeah, and I predict I predicted that after the gun ban, that they were going to go for hate speech. Um, I said it to all my friends, all my family. I was like. He's gonna go for hate speech. Like this is, this is indicative of of of, of tyranny. Mm. Yeah, I, I think we are seeing some very unsettling things. And I mean, I, I suppose sometimes I sit there and I wonder, you know, when we look at facts and when we look at investigation and critical thought and critical thinking, uh, often there is a confusion sometimes that I have because. Uh, I'm trying to put my thoughts in order. That's not going to seem disrespectful because I think I think our prime minister. She comes from. A, she has a good heart. I think she is coming from a, a place of feeling. But mm -hmm. I think we're also going to see, and we are starting to see that that old phrase, you know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, because I mean, even the part where she was wearing a hijab, and I remember that. I, that made a distinct impression on me because it had only been about a week since I was reading through about the uh, Iranian human rights lawyer who's just been sentenced to, I think, 38 years in prison, 145 lashes, because she has defended a woman who decided to take off their hijab in Iran. And so the changes that are going on right as we speak, while 
people like you and I, we can see that there, this has got a very, uh, this is an incremental step to a very scary destination. Most people are just sitting there um, enjoying the E minor chords of the latest sing song and the pictures and the media pushing Miss Ardern as if she is, uh, uh, you know, leading the charge in terms of kindness and compassion and these words that are used, but they have little bearing as to the destination in which we are heading. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. And, and like, I don't think even that she's necessarily malicious. I think you could make that case. But I don't think that she necessarily is. But even if she's, oh, I think she's got. A, I think she's. I think she's coming from a good heart in herself. I think she herself has got uh, a very strong sense of innocence about that. I don't think she knows really what she's putting in place. I agree with you, but all I'm saying is I can understand where somebody would make that case. Yeah, she's sure. she's being malicious. Um, yeah. But even so. Um, the Jimmy, uh, the Jimmy, the, the German government, um, <laughs> the German government before Hitler wasn't malicious, and they put in gun control and all this kind of stuff, and then Hitler got in, and he he took power without uh, revolution because there was no one to revolt. Guns were yeah. very far and few between anyway. Yeah. 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 Um, just to end this off, I think we, I want to jump over to Objective 22, um, because this is concerning, not for any kind of other reason apart from for, for, um, oh, yes. The, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. for the economy. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and again, I think it's also, I mean, I think uh, Objective 22 is even deeper than uh, just the economy, because... I mean, again, it's this weird this dissolution of uh, of our boundaries, of barriers, mm -hmm. uh, and and consequently our sovereignty. Because if you've got an area where you are making sure that everyone gets what they got somewhere else, and then you're paying it out, um, actually, you, again, you're asserting a type of a type of spiderweb type control over the other countries because by implementing these relationships between countries and saying, right, because of this particular document and this agreement, we are going to make sure that you get this, this and this, you get that funding, that funding, and it comes over. Um, because it just, again, it makes the, the uh, areas of sovereignty or the areas of boundaries even more diluted I suppose would be the best way um, and we can and we see that because each country will start to not have its own uh, ability to decide what, how they want to have migration uh, and I think that would probably that comes under the whole sovereignty aspect I, New Zealand deals with migration the way they want if we want to give uh, super annuits their money if they go overseas as we do in many cases anyway fine, no problem if, they, if we don't, then that's our decision. Mm -hmm. We should not be committing to an obligation to do that just because uh, the UN tells us that we should. Uh, because, again, it'll cost money. And I think there's also actually a part, it's not in the ob obligations, but I think it's in one of the details that each country that's under this agreement will also pay for and train under their own watch people who will facilitate this agreement. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to call them political officers or anything, right. but, uh, you know, it, it's nearly reading like it's out of some type of George Orwell book. Yeah, well, exactly, and that's the thing, is, like, I never, I was, like, a year ago, I thought it would be stupid to read George Orwell, right, and I was, like, no, there's no way, there's no way our government's getting like that, maybe a little bit, they're getting a little bit, um, nosy in our business and everything, but there's no way they're going to become George Orwell's reality, you know? Um, and then I realized that George Orwell was writing these books pretty much straight after Nazi Germany. I was like, it's like, 
he he lived there and he knew what happened there, and I think he just wrote it down as as um, a record of hey, this is what can happen. And uh, I I think he's I think he's amazing, and I love George Orwell's books. Oh, I, I I we have the same birthday. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh gosh, um, I think the 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 problem with um. Objective 22 for me is that, one, I'm hidden on Social Security for New Zealanders anyway. Um, mm. But why are we giving Social Security to those who are just coming here who haven't even ha haven't even gained citizenship? Um, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it even goes further, too, because um, in another couple of the objectives, it's not just that, but there is also an argument that can be made that we that we provide them with exactly what we provide our citizens. So you're talking about free education, free housing, uh, to to a point. Even one of the other objectives, you're talking about uh, to set them up with a job. Uh, so so that's not right. That's not fair to our people. Well, no, and especially because we a we don't have enough housing anyway. Um, yep. B, we don't have enough work. Yep, that's right. And and C, we should be allowed to, as 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 a country, choose who comes into our country, um, rather than have say refugees being forced on us when we we may not even know the culture um, and that kind of stuff. Um, yes, yeah, and you've actually sort of caught on to one there because when we do look at what would what would be um, an, a, an immigration policy that we want. You know, we want, we want a, an immigration policy that benefits New Zealand. Whoever they are, whatever culture they come from, doesn't really matter. So, I mean, even if we think about the first level, if you speak English, no matter what country that is, whether it's Singapore, uh, whether it's uh, one of the islands, whether it's one of the um, African nations where English is a language, great, no problem. But uh, from the get-go, you've got to put in places, you've got to put in rules that actually benefit us, which may seem selfish, but we've got to look after our people first before we can look after others. Right. Well, and the thing is about that culture thing as well, which is even more concerning, um, to me at least, I was talking to a someone from Saudi Arabia who came over here, and now he's a Christian, and 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 when he became a Christian, his parents from Saudi Arabia um, had orders for people to come and kidnap him and take him back. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I don't want to. Uh, I don't know if I want to go there because it's so soon. I don't know if I want to go there because it's so soon. But but let's just say some stuff happened in that mosque that we shouldn't be just throwing under the rug, um, similar stuff happening. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we can definitely something that can be discussed uh, at some point anyway. Mm. Right, no, my, but yeah, but my point is these cultures that come here, they don't align, align with us at all. And, um, and when you have fanatics like you had that day, um, you can see how they get their message across. Um, not saying it was a good message because it was a terrible message, but every, even every bad message has some, you know, some kind of truth to it. Um, every lie has some truth to it to get people there. Um, and and uh, I read the document that he'd done before it was made illegal to have it, and I could see the I, I saw the truth that he had, and the truth was this migration pact basically, um, and the fact that these cultures are coming over, and I can see how somebody can transition to that, to where he was, and I'm not condoning him at all. I think that's mm. ugly, but I can see how that transition can be made. Um, yeah, into the line of thinking. I mean, yeah, I mean. Yeah, probably whatever, because I remember I had a look through it several times uh, when I looked through his manifesto when I was trying to work his pathology out, um, you know, from a layman's point of view anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, 
But we had lines of thought that were thought out, like they were thought out. Some of them were inaccurate, some of them were accurate, um, but there was all, it was very disjointed. So yep. it had been as if he had taken on a few things which were accurate and then sort of uh, uh, built scaffolding type thinking around it. So he didn't actually have a, a base per se, because when we talk about things like culture, and I know we're sort of drifting off a bit, but when we do discuss things like culture and the pros and cons in various countries and nations and independent sovereign states, um, that's a very big topic, uh, but he missed, that's where he became disjointed. Um, he didn't seem to have a deep basis of, I'm not sure if I'd say knowledge, as I would say perhaps experience in understanding what those cultures were and the parts that do align and the parts that don't align and all, I mean, all that. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole other discussion, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I agree. And, and I just found the part that you were talking about before, too, about where it says about all the, all the other services like healthcare and all that kind of stuff. It was mm. Objective 15. Before we continue, I just want to talk about Himalaya. This platform is a YouTube of podcasts, and I and many other awesome podcasters laid the foundations of our house there, or here, wherever you are listening to this podcast. All the descriptions to this podcasting site are in the description below. And now, back to our conversation. And, and yeah, it absolutely does. It talks about how uh, they want—I don't know—they want to make it so that healthcare providers um, can't discriminate, which I think is kind of ridiculous when you actually think about it. Because yeah. there, are, there are health issues that people from, say, um, Iran have that we don't t typically get, um, which comes from, comes from um, the, the line of incest that happens in Iran. And oh, so, I mean, well, yeah, and, and, and don't forget, what happens if, uh, if certain groups over there, whichever, and I don't, you know, whatever group they are, but there are some areas who believe in female geni uh, genitalia mutilation. Mm -hmm. yep. We don't. That is not part of what we are about. We do not believe in that whatsoever. But some cultures do accept that. Uh, so what happens at those points? Right, exactly. And, and at that point, there's like, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. It's it's a mess of a of a migration pack, really. Um, and I'm not completely against you know refugee status and whatever. Um, I don't think we should be bringing in as many refugees because ref the refugee international law is that refugees go to the next safest country, the closest safest country. Um, yeah, which now has been blown out of the water with this because the closest, safest well, country for most yeah. of the... Yeah, and I've got a real big issue, actually, with the way in which we've um, recently started to um, uh, allow refugees. Because at the moment, we just take, mostly, who the UN wants us to take. Yeah. Whereas, why are we not going to the, the NGOs who are over there and actually telling them, all right, who really needs us to take them? Right. So what about who's, who's cool of the week? And that's another part of the issue that we have with this pact, is that the pact um, doesn't really differentiate between humanitarian and economic. Right. We want to help people who really need our help, not people who are fleeing something because they can't get jobs over there, for example. Yeah. So, you know, and I'll give Venezuela as a great example. Well, if that was the case, then, then it'd be so easy for, to get from here to, to another country. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get you. And and I think there's a way to fix that. And I think, um, Mr. Have you heard of Mr. Reagan? Um, not not Ronald, not Ronald Reagan. <laughs> uh, uh, he makes a he makes a, a suggestion that to at least help with this, uh, when we accept refugees, um, he's in America, but when we as countries uh, accept refugees, we should only accept. A uh, woman, and and he says little girls. I'll say, maybe not. I'd I'd say you know I don't mind all children, um, but 
I think that's something we should look at at least to help this because I think a lot oh, of. Oh, I've heard this one, right? And he reckons that um, the men should be over there sorting out whatever the country they've fled or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, gotcha, gotcha. I think that's a really good idea. Um, and and also, why do we only get refugees from the Middle East as well? I don't like. I'm not discriminatory to the Middle East, but yeah. I mean, there are people in South Africa being, you know, killed right now uh, for the fact that they're just white, you know. So why aren't we bringing yeah, in and these and people? That's why I, think, I mean, um, I've been watching very closely to the news as to what's happening in Nigeria, where mm -hmm. you've got entire villages are being murdered. Nothing, you know, nothing less than murdered. That's that's men, women, children. Right. A lot of them. Uh, and so, why don't we get people from there who are under direct threat of of uh, religious cleansing? What about um, what What about the Christians from China as well, who are now being persecuted for their faith? Why aren't we bring Why aren't we bringing the Chinese people over here? Yes, absolutely right. I mean, it seems like, at least from the perspective of of the government, that the only minority that can be affected by any kind of persecution is the Middle East. And I think that is dead wrong. I think we still should be maybe bringing in some from the Middle East, but I think we should be bringing in a lot from other places as well, because there's so many that have been persecuted. People in India that, that have been uh, have been uh, uh, denied um, help from their government because they have converted to Christianity. People in Russia who um, who are persecuted for sharing their faith in the street. So I mean, I I think that we should, if we're going to do this refugee thing, we should do it right. Yeah. Yes, I, I definitely agree. Um, and I think if you if you're looking at the way in which refugees are chosen, and I don't know this for sure, but um, it may have to do again with the with those who are the democratic principles that they have where uh, certain areas are now filled up with certain countries and are sort of pushing out certain people that they decide on. And, and I don't know enough about the intricacies of the, their democracy that they utilise, but this is, this, could be, this is definitely one of those areas where it's not so much of a positive as it is the way they've used the, democr the democratic system for their own benefit. Right, 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 right. No, I, I'm in a complete agreement. Well, I mean, it's been about 40 minutes, and uh, it's been a great conversation. Um, where can people find you? Oh, they can find me online on Facebook and on Twitter. On Twitter, I'm Ellie Ikile, and on Facebook, uh, you'll find my, well, you should find us, New Conservative, or you can find my Ellie Ikile, Deputy Leader, New Conservative. Awesome. All right, thank you for coming on, and uh, this has been great. I'll, uh, I hope to have you on again. Uh, maybe at the end of the year, when you've sorted out more of your policies, um, that'd be great. Awesome, awesome. No, thank you, Leighton, and thank you all. Awesome, have a great day. All right, cheers, brother. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.